morning, everybody, and welcome to the uh, second in this series of readers' lecture nights. And I'm delighted to be able to welcome this evening Master Leslie Thomas, who's going to speak to us this evening on what does it mean to be anti-racist in a profession full of privileged people. Uh, Master Leslie Thomas has is well known and uh, has a, a very um, uh, great career in uh, a leading expert in claims against the police and other public authorities and he has expertise in inquests and public inquiries so for example just two of the inquiries he's been involved in are the Hillsborough and the Birmingham pub bombing inquiry. He's also professor of law at Gresham College um, having been appointed last year and this year uh, for Gresham College it also has a series of lectures on death the state and human rights which many of you I'm sure will be very interested in. As I say, he's a bencher of the Inner Temple. He's been involved in advocacy training uh, and also in the equality, diversity and inclusivity agenda of the Inn. We're very delighted to have him speak this evening on this very interesting uh, subject. Uh, and I'm going to welcome him now to speak to you. Leslie Thomas. Uh, thank you, Master Reader. Thank you for that very warm introduction. Okay. Um, I'm going to share some slides with you. C could the slides be put up, please? So, what does it mean to be anti-racist in a profession full of privileged people? Next slide. What is it you want me to reconcile myself to? You always told me it takes time. It's taken my father's time my mother's time, my uncle's time, my brother's and sister's time, my niece's and nephew's time. How much time do you want for your progress? James Baldwin, The Price of the Ticket. Let me tell you a story. As I entered the courthouse, I had to pass through security. There was a reasonably long queue. I got into line. I had my robes under my arm, my wig on top of my papers, which were tied with the traditional pink ribbon, the trademark and badge of recognition for the job in barrister. I was dressed in a rather dapper pinstripe suit. In line before me were several other people. Many of the people entering the courtroom were waiting in line, looked like me. We shared the same pig skin color, black. However, it was clear to me that these people were not lawyers waiting to get into court, but more likely to be court users, members of the lay public, either claimants or defendants or friends and families of claimants or defendants, or perhaps even witnesses. There were white faces too. Some of the white faces were also members of the public or their friends, family or potential witnesses. Other white faces were lawyers. They had the same dress code as me. The reality is you cannot miss a brief in court. I was new to this court, it wasn't my local area. It was a combined courthouse dealing with both civil and criminal matters and I was jobbing out of town in a part of the country I wasn't used to. Many of the white barristers were called upon by the security staff and ushered through. They put their bags on the table. These were not even properly looked through or they were simply waved through by the security guards. No security guard called on me to the front like my white counterparts. I was made to stand in line like everyone else. Eventually I got to the front of the line. I was asked by the security guard what my business was at court. I explained the case I was appearing in. I was then given a solid pat-down search, despite the fact that the security scanner had not gone off. My bag was thoroughly searched. I was made to open my files. With good grace and a smile, I thanked the security guards for their time. I commented on the weather and asked where the courtroom was located and if they recommended the food in the court canteen. I smiled with them. They did not smile with me. I then proceeded to my courtroom. Now, anyone who knows me knows that I do not robe in traditional barristers' robing rooms, as these tend to have security codes to get into them. And to find someone who knows the code and then to remember it, I find rather annoying. So I go to court and tend to put my collar, wig and gown on in there. 
As I walked down the corridor, I saw the usher from my court. I approached her, asked her whether I was in the right place. Again, with a dismissiveness, she said to me, court isn't open. You'll have to wait until your case is called on. I said, excuse me, madam, I'd like to go into court before the case is called on so I could get ready. She said, you can't. Only the lawyers and the judge go into court early. I realised to my horror, she thought I was the lay client. I presume she had only seen the colour of my skin. I then said to her, Madam, I'm not the client. She looked at me, this time a little bit more closely, and said, Are you family or witness? No, Madam, I replied. Are you the solicitor's clerk? I again patiently replied, No, I was not. I then nodded down to my wig, which was sitting on top of my papers I'd been holding all of this time, and I said, I'm the barrister. The look on her face said it all. She was shocked and surprised, and in fairness to her, very apologetic. My case started. The entire theatre of the courtroom was white, save for my client who was bringing his case against white police officers from uh, police misconduct. The judge came out and during the case was particularly hostile to me and intervened at every possible stage, undermining my cross-examination, saying, this is not how you ask questions. Where were, you, where were you taught? I was made to look incredibly small in front of the witnesses being cross-examined in the jury. At the break, my client was concerned and said to me, Leslie, is he doing this because you're black? Your questions are no different to the other barrister's questions. My solicitor made the same point. My client was concerned that his case was suffering because his entire legal team were black and the entire courtroom was white. Even the jury were all white. Of course, my client was right, but I reassured him and said the judge was probably just a bit grumpy because I would say something if it continued. After an unnecessary intervention, before I had even asked a question, I fought back and said to the judge that he was giving the jury the wrong impression that perhaps he was biased. And if he continued in that way, my client was not getting a fair trial. The judge was so shocked, denied any bias, and for the rest of the very short trial, did everything he could to make it look as if he was being fair. Now, the outcome of the trial is irrelevant to this story, but it is the perception and the effect that the case had on my client, my professional client, the jury, and my other professional colleagues in court, the court staff and myself. You see, but if you're really interested, my client won his case and was awarded compensation. Next slide, please. Elijah Lowell said in his book, The Clapback, quote, it's tiring to always have to push back against the notice that we are lesser, to constantly have to justify our existence, our entitlement to basic civil rights and the need for equality. Let me start with some definitions. It's important that I'm clear about terminology. When I refer to black, I'm not using this term in the 1970s meaning of political blackness, meaning all non-white people who have a common fight against discrimination and thereby embodying people of African, Caribbean and Asian descent and other minorities. Of course, I understand political blackness, but I feel firstly, we've moved on from this time. That's not to say that there's still not a common struggle among minority peoples, or I should say, if you look at this worldwide, the ethnic majority. But I believe this confuses and clouds the picture since not all minority groups experience the same problems. Our struggles are different because we are treated differently. Statistics in terms of the treatment of races bears this out. So I personally prefer to use the term people of African heritage or descent. So predominantly, uh, African Caribbean people. But the word black is very much ingrained in our lexicon, so I might use that as well. But if I want to use or refer to the ethnic majority in the world population more generally, I shall use the expression people of colour. So what does it mean to be anti-racist in a system so full of white privilege? some history. 
So few of us know much about our racist history. It's, it is quite literally whitewashed. Next slide, please. As Akala noted in his book, Natives, Race and Class in the Ruins of Empire, I spent several history classes learning about the Second World War and the atrocities of the Nazi, that the Nazis committed, but not a word about the crimes of the British Empire. I was taught that the concentration camps of Auschwitz were an example of the, one of the most heinous things human beings have done to one another, but nothing of the Mau Mau concentration camps run by the British Empire in Kenya a good five years after the liberation of Auschwitz camps. Firstly, we have to be appreciative and have some understanding that our history and system of laws defended a tyrannical empire for many hundreds of years in which human trafficking, enslavement of people, rape and murder of an entire race of people based upon skin colour was lawful and justified. In short, the mass murdering white supremacist piracy of the British Empire, which starved millions of people to death in India, enslaved and tortured millions more in countless locations, and often used its power to crush, not enhance, popular democracy and economic development, when doing so suited larger aims. Quote by Akala. We have a system of laws which used to see humans as mere chattels. So when the question is posed, can those of us who dispense justice or are involved in the business of justice be immune from racism? I would like to shout out, of course not. But despite the fact I believe the answer to be obvious, there are still so many of us who still require convincing or believe that these are all matters of the past. But ask yourself this, when does the present become the past? During my lifetime, education and career, we had the sus laws. We had a government which refused to outrightly condemn a racist apartheid system and even sought to encourage trade with the racist South African government. You see, history will eventually come back and reveal the truth. And history isn't always pretty or flattering. Next slide, please. As Bob Senpul wrote in his book, Race, Jail versus Bail, throughout the British plantation system, it was customary for planters, for the planters to become magistrates. They were the people responsible for the constant whipping and other forms of torture of enslaved Africans, in addition to performing their roles as justices. After emancipation, the planters continued to act as magistrates and dispense justice, sometimes very harshly. Negative perceptions of black people and black. Kendi, in his book on how to be an anti-racist, sums it up like this. Racist ideas love believers, not thinkers. I believe it's important to understand some of the historical reasons for the differential treatment of black people and why this may continue to this day. Next slide, please. In Akala's Natives, he states that both white, black and white children generally understand very early that blackness is a synonym for bad and that whiteness is synonymous with wealth, power and beauty. For black children in Britain, our bodies commit the sin of reminding people racialized as white of an uncomfortable truth about how this nation became wealthy and that the good old days when white power could roam the earth unchallenged are over. They now have to contend with one of their empire's many legacies, a multi-ethnic mother country. Next slide, please. Colin Bob Semple in his book writes, under the paragraph headed survival of the fairest, Fryer commented in the 19th century, sociologists assumed that white skin and Anglo-Saxon civilization were the culmination of the evolutionary process, Fryer, 1984. The power of this theory was that in 
1876, at about the time of the Atlantic trafficking in enslaved Africans was ending, Cesare Lombroso, an Italian prison doctor who is said to be the founding father of positive school of criminology, included darker skin and thick curly hair in a list of physical features of atavism, which he said were displayed by criminals, savages and apes who were known as an evolutionary throwback to an earlier age. This was known as a theory of criminal anthropology. Next slide. His views were subject to critical analysis by various commentators and were associated by Savitz to have coincided with the rise of social Darwinism, which justified racism and inequality on the basis of evolutionary principles. Lombroso's pupils, Fern and Garofalo, supported Mussolini's fascist regime in Italy and extended the theory further to the point where Garofalo uh, argued that criminals and their progeny should be eliminated in various ways by death or long-term life imprisonment and transportation. This theory helped to perpetuate the myth of the criminal ape-like black cannibal swinging from tree to tree and contained in Tarzan comic books. Rudy Narayan referred to this as to this image as which appeared even the minds of one or two judges in the old Bailey in his book. You see, we as a people are often othered, seen as different. Bob Semple gives numerous examples of academics and researchers showing this. Humphrey and Gus, John, referred to young black people who were seen as projecting something foreign or alien in 1971. Anthony Lester and Geoffrey Byman referred to a widely published lecture delivered in 1969 by Lord Radcliffe, a former Lord of Appeal, in which it echoed a theme of the foreign character of Britain's black communities. Examples of what Lord Radcliffe was reported to have said were that black communities were the guests of white host community, that they were largely alien wedge, that they carried with their colour a flag of strangeness, and that all their strangeness implied that they were rather colonies of immigrant workers and immigrant settlers in the full sense, many of whom would one day return to their homelands in Lester and Byman's book in 1972. <laughs> Rudy Narayan referred to the image of black people as servile and subservient savages in Africa uh, and slaves in the Caribbean. Stuart Hall described, described the damaging effects of the British media reportings of muggins in America, which resulted in a transmission to Britain of all the troubling themes and images which went with it one of which was the fear of sudden robbery by black youths. You see, it's necessary to appreciate the history of black people's experience, in particular, the African Caribbean resistance over three centuries against oppression and brutality by slavers, the plantocracy, colonial governors, administrators, magistrates, and the police who exercised authority and control over them for the benefit of the ruling classes. These ruling classes also lauded it over the working classes in England during the 18th and 19th centuries. Bob Semple. <laughs> Even in the 2020s, we still have images for these racist views today. Men of African heritage in their encounters with the police are often described as powerful with superhuman strength needing several police officers to help restrain them. Let's look at some statistics, real evidence and timings. There has been a real discussion about race in the public discourse following the horrific killing of unarmed black men, particularly the death of George Floyd, whose death was captured on video and we see him dying before our eyes, calling out for his dead mother. This has led us to ask questions about 
race discrimination racism and how to be anti-racist and live and work in a truly anti-racist way it's important for me given the work to which i have dedicated my life to to discuss recent events and what we can do to bring about change in our society racism and discriminatory behaviors pervades all levels of society and our legal system and our profession the bar is not immune from the same Next slide, please. <laughs> My story recounted at the very beginning of this talk is far from unique. I was talking about some time ago. Many of my colleagues from the black African community or people of color have had similar stories. In most recent times, just looking at last year, we had Alexandra Wilson and um, Luke McLean, uh, who come to mind. Just think about it. If I, as a professional, can be treated in this way, and I'm a member of a well-respected profession, it takes very little imagination to think how defendants of African heritage are treated. You see, differential treatment of people of color occurs at all levels in the legal system. Differential and unfavorable treatment in encounters with the police, decisions as to whether to charge or not, bail or not, in the way that they are prosecuted, sentence, the type of sentence, the length of sentence, treatment in prison, how they're disciplined in prison, whether they receive parole decisions, and so on. Don't take my word for it. Look at the government's own report. <coughs> the Lamy Review in 2017 in which David Lamy analyzed that the disproportionate treatment of, I'm gonna use the expression used in the report, baying, oof, baying people in the criminal justice system makes for depressing reading. Some of the statistics will come as no surprise to anyone who's been following the news, such as the fact that black people are six times more likely to be stopped and searched by the police than white people. But it's not just the police who have a race problem. It occurs in our judiciary. The review showed that BAME defendants were 240% times more likely to be given a prison sentence for a drug offense than white defendants. Black people only make up 3% of the general population, but make up 12% of prisoners, 21% of children in custody. Every single one of those black prisoners, including those black children, were sent to prison by judge. Interestingly, the review also found by contrast that there is no evidence to suggest racial bias in juries' decisions to convict or, or acquit, suggesting that our judges have a bigger race problem than our juries do. Nor is it just the criminal courts that have a race problem. In the immigration system, a system which traces its modern roots to the profoundly racist Commonwealth and Immigrants Act of 1962 and the 1968 and the 1971 Immigration Act, judges sit in judgment on people of colour every day. Some of these people are seeking asylum in the UK and have experienced horrific traumas in their home countries. Some are victims of human trafficking and similar abuses. Some are people who have lived here for most of their lives, are British in all but name, but are now being ripped apart from their home, their families, their children because of criminal convictions. Sadly, if not surprisingly, the attitudes of people who administer this system today can be at times racist and colonialist, as those of the people who created it in the 60s and 70s. Under the Equalities Act 2010, there's a general duty required of public bodies in the exercise of their functions to pay regard to the need to eliminate unlawful discrimination, harassment and victimization and any other conduct that is prohibited by or under the Equality Act. That's the Equality Aim Act Aim 1. And to advance equality and opportunity between persons who share irrelevant protected characteristics and persons who do not share it. That's Equality Act Aim 2 to foster good relationships between persons who share a relevant uh, uh, characteristic and with people who do not share it. That's Equality Act Aim 3. 
However, the public sector equality duty does not apply to the exercise of judicial functions. That's paragraph three of Schedule 18 of the Equality Act 2010. Arguably, it should. Now, there may well be some pushback from those who say the judiciary and the court should be exempt because it undermines their independence. But I do not agree. I see no good reason why this principle should not apply to judges. The question then becomes one of enforceability and the mechanisms for the same. But there is a real problem in getting this message across to the profession. The legal profession, particularly the senior parts of the profession, lack meaningful racial diversity. Recent statistics shine a light on how diverse we really are. The recent diversity at the bar 2019 statistics, and again, the uh, bar standards boards, income at the bar, gender and ethnicity um, figures, see their report in November of last year, 2020, make very uncomfortable reading. It has long been well known that there is an underrepresentation of people of colour in the Chancery and Commercial Bar and in other specialist sectors. Why are there more people of colour in less lucrative and or publicly funded areas such as family or crime? And even where we have black talent, what is the excuse for black people on average and particularly black women earning lower fees than their white counterparts? Why is there still at the gross underrepresentation of black judges? In 2021, there are still no full-time black male high court judges. We had one full-time black woman high court judge in recent times who's since retired. There are no black court of appeal judges. There are no black Supreme Court judges. Again, I could spend a considerable amount of time outlining the statistics, but don't listen to me. For example, of the differential treatment of black people, look at Bob Semple's book, 2012. Look at the Lamy Review, 2017. Look at the Bar Standards Board annual figures. Look at the Bar Council's work. Look at Baroness McGregor Smith's report, The Time for Talking is Over. These facts are there to be considered and analysed. So, does our profession truly believe in a modern, diverse and representative bar? So, the answer to, so to answer this question, there's a preliminary question, namely, are we prepared to embrace the fact that there are problems? Everyone knows there about over racism. Yes, I've experienced this at the bar. And I, but this isn't a lecture about me. This isn't a lecture about one person. I don't want to be, I don't want this lecture to be dismissed as one man's anecdotes that can simply be dismissed. Next slide, please. I think Akala summed it up right when he said this. Despite much seeming and some very real progress, public discourse about racism is still as childish and supine as it ever was. Where we do discuss race in public, we've been trained to see racism, if we see it at all, as an issue of interpersonal morality. Good people are not racist, only bad people are. This neat binary is a great way of avoiding any real discussion at all. Next slide, please. Or as Peggy McIntosh describes it. I did not see myself as a racist because I was taught to recognize racism only in individual acts of meanness by members of my group, never in invisible systems conferring unsought racial dominance on my group from birth. The concept of institutional racism was coined in 1967 by Carmichael and Hamilton when they said, quote, Racism is both overt and covert. It takes two closely related forms. Individual whites acting against individual blacks and acts by the total white community about against the black community. 
We call these individual racism and institutional racism. The first consists of overt acts by individuals which causes death, injury and violent destruction of property. This type can be recorded by television cameras. It can frequently be observed in the process of its, of its commission. The second type is less overt, far more subtle, less identifiable in terms of specific individuals committing the acts, but it is no less destructive of human life. The second type originates in the operation of established and respected forces in society and thus receives far less public condemnation than the first type. When the white terrorist bombs the black church and kills five black children, that is an act of individual racism, widely deplored by most segments of society. But when we see that same city, Birmingham, Alabama, 500 black babies die each year because of the lack of proper food, shelter, and medical facilities, and thousands more are destroyed and maimed physically, emotionally, intellectually because of the conditions of poverty and discrimination in the black community. That is a function of institutional racism. When a black family moves into a home in a white neighborhood and is stoned, burned, or routed out, they are victims of overt acts of individual racism, which many people will condemn, at least in words. But it is institutional racism that keeps black people locked in dilapidated slum tenements, subject to the daily prey of exploitative slum lords, merchants, loan sharks, and discriminatory real estate agents. The society either pretends it does not know of this latter situation or is in fact incapable of doing anything meaningful about it. That brings me on to the Stephen Lawrence inquiry by Sir William McPherson. And just before I go on to this next quote, it's with great sadness to note um, the passing of Sir William. He, he passed this weekend and you know his work in relation to the Stephen Lawrence inquiry was seminal in terms of bringing the whole concept of institutional racism into our, our lexicon in this country. And let me quote from McPherson's report. He said this, unwitting racism can arise because of a lack of understanding, ignorance or mistaken beliefs. It can arise from well-intentioned but patronizing words or actions. It can arise from unfamiliarity with the behavior or cultural traditions of people or families from minority ethnic communities. It can arise from racist stereotyping of black people as potential criminals or troublemakers. Often this arises out of uncritical self-understanding born out of an inflexible police ethos of a traditional way of doing things. Furthermore, such attitudes can thrive in a tightly knit communities, so they can be a collective failure to detect and, out, and to outlaw this, this breed of racism. The police canteen can too easily be its breeding ground. Let me ask this question. Why is the robing room or the closeted plush chambers of those of us at the bar any more immune than a police canteen? from discrimination? Is it because we consider ourselves higher mortals, such reasonable and intellectual people who cannot be subjected to racism? As Sir William McPherson in, and his inquiry found, taking all we have heard and read into account, we grapple with the problem. For the purposes of our inquiry, the concept of institutional racism which we apply consists of the collective failure of an organization to provide an appropriate and professional service to people because of their color, culture, or ethnic origin. It can be seen or detected in the processes, attitudes, and behavior which amount to discrimination through unwitting prejudice, ignorance, thoughtlessness, and racial stereotyping which disadvantage minority ethnic people. It persists because of the failure of organizations openly and adequately to recognize and address its existence and causes by policy, example, and leadership. Without recognition and action to eliminate such racism, it can prevail as part of the ethos or culture of the organization. It is a corrosive disease. 
later, McPherson and his inquiry found, given the central nature of the issue, we feel that it's important at once to state our conclusion that institutional racism within the terms of its description set out above exists both in the Metropolitan Police Service and other police services and other institutions countrywide. End of quote. Other institutions includes the legal profession. It includes us, the bar. Some harsh realities need to be confronted. Other institutions includes our profession. Yes, the bar. Yes, once said to be a gentleman's profession, even with all the misogyny that grand title masks, the fact that our profession traditionally has discriminated against individuals on all levels, gender, race, class and disability. Firstly, to discuss diversity and improving diversity, particularly as it concerns race, there needs to be a proper and honest discussion about racism. You see, it is possible to get to the top of our profession without ever discussing racism. It's not a job requirement to get to the top of our profession to do that. It's possible to turn the blind eye to it. We can pretend we don't see it, it isn't there. We can be comfortable with the status quo or the cards we have been dealt with. However, the reality is it is there for all to see if we care to look. We as a profession have to move beyond seeing racism as individual characteristics. We need to understand racism as a system, not an event. None of us are exempt from its forces. Racism impacts differently on different groups. I often ask myself why discussion on racism is such a difficult subject. As Peggy McIntosh noted, quote, it seems to me that obliviousness about white advantage, like an obliviousness, obliviousness about male advantage is strongly inculcated in our society so as to maintain the myth of a meritocracy, the myth that a democratic choice is equally available to all, keeping most people unaware that freedoms of confident action is there for just a small number of people, props up those in power and serves keep in power, keep power in the hands of those very same groups who mostly already have it. End of quote. There's a lot of guilt and head, head placed in sand over the fact that the white majority ethnic group in our society have a distinct advantage over minority groups because of concepts such as privilege, bias, and, the, and at times blatant and unwarranted discrimination. A lot of time in recent years has been focused on the elimination of discrimination often referred to as direct discrimination and attempts to dis tackle indirect discrimination, but often this type of discrimination is more insidious and difficult to establish. Now, I don't wanna make this a discussion on what legally amounts to discrimination and who and how should tackle that. Discrimination law is not my primary area of practice. And to be quite frank with you, that shouldn't be the focus of this talk from a legal point of view. We as a profession should, shouldn't be forced to make changes simply because it is illegal. There's a strong moral argument as to why our profession should be leading the way. It is right and just, to, it is the right and just thing to do in a so-called honorable profession. The problem that we need to confront requires more than just a legal solution, in my opinion. Some of the best writers on this subject in recent years have not been lawyers. As far back as 1988, Peggy McIntosh wrote, I was taught to think that racism could end if white individuals changed their attitude, but a white skin in the United States, and I would add in the United Kingdom, opens many more doors for whites, whether or not we approve of the way dominance has been conferred upon us. Individual acts can palliate, um, but not end these uh, problems. More recently, I wrote in Council Magazine in July 2020. It's a flawed and outdated view of racism to believe that the racist is an individual con consciously does not like people based on race and, and is intentionally mean to them. 
Such definition is the deflection which protects the system. When our profession recognises that racism doesn't necessarily come from individuals, doesn't need to be conscious, doesn't need to be intentional, we will be moving in the right direction. Racial injustice and racism isn't a simple binary question. The racist needn't simply be bad, ignorant, bigoted, prejudiced or old. The non-racist isn't necessarily the good person, educated, progressive, open or fair-minded, well-intended or young. This discussion goes well beyond this, end of quote. If you believe in your chambers that your chambers is colorblind and you think you treat everyone the same, then my friend, you have a problem. Colorblindness does not work in a system where everyone at the top of the judicial power is white and everyone in the best chambers is white and the two best universities in the country have a lack of black entrance and the top private schools are predominantly white. And lo and behold, from these ranks, the predominant of our profession, judges have traditionally been chosen. You see, if you're a person of color, just seeing this would set alarm bells ringing. Where I come from, we would say, don't take me for a mug. You see, you cannot take race off the table. It needs to be discussed. If you recognize that systems and structures were designed to disadvantage marginalized groups, the expectation should then be that those in the dominant group use their access, privilege, and opportunity to make way for those that the same access, privilege, and opportunity has been denied. Acknowledgement and acceptance of the truth, no matter how uncomfortable. I read online a quote from a, on a student forum when researching this talk. This quote epitomizes how many white people who may well be well-intentioned genuinely feel, quote, I'm a white male who has enjoyed relatively good success in life. I feel I've earned it. And I resent when it's implied that my success is attributed to privilege. Many of those who lack a measure of success resent it when it is implied that their shortcoming is attributed to anything other than a lack of privilege. Next slide, please. But as uh, Peggy McIntosh points out uh, in, in her book, she says, I think whites are carefully taught not to recognize white privilege as males are not taught to recognize male privilege. So I have begun in an untutored way to ask what it is like to have white privilege. I've come to see white privilege as an invisible package of unearned assets that I can count on cashing in each day, but about which I was meant to remain oblivious. White privilege is like an invisible weightless naps, uh, knapsack of special provisions, maps, passports, code books, visas, clothes, tools, and blank checks. The anti-racist approach, what does it mean? to be anti-racist. Kendi says, and this is a quote that you have on the slide at the beginning of his book, racist, one who is supporting a racist policy through their actions or inactions or expressing a racist idea. Anti-racist, one who is supporting an anti-racist policy through their actions or expressing an anti-racist idea. Positive actions. You see, the anti-racist is not afraid to discuss this as an issue, but you will be met with the following charges. And let me ask you this, how often do you hear these comments? Why do you need to keep on talking about it? Here, the accusation is twofold. Somehow that by highlighting the problem about racism, the messenger is making the problem worse. Or if we stop talking about it, it will go away. Well, firstly, the problem with A is that it comes. this comes down to victim blaming, particularly if the per messenger is the person who is the target of the racist treatment, action or policy. The problem with B is, is this reminds me of Donald Trump's assertion in, in, in spring of last year about COVID. Just ignore it and it will magically go away. 
This is the ostrich approach. Leave it alone and hope it will go away or sorts itself out. You see, racism is like a cancer. You cannot ignore it. It needs attention if it is to be treated and sometimes it just needs to be cut out. The anti-racist, particularly if she is a person of colour, will be told, stop playing the race card. At its very basic, this is saying, if you're an ethnic minority and things don't go in your way, then it's the easy excuse for whatever shortcomings you are trying to hide. But as Akalis stated in his book, Natives, quote, racism is apparently a card to be played to advantage. The strangest thing I've heard. It is a card which only is ever played by non-white people to excuse, I suppose, personal failings, even those of us who are successful. The other charge will be met with, it's all in the past, get over it. We wouldn't dream of saying this about the horrors of the Nazis and the deplorable treatment of the Jews, and nor should we. The horrors of the transatlantic slave trade and the murder, rape and enslavement of millions of people is still very much alive today in the way it's impacted us. So no, we will not get over it. Or we might be met with, you have a chip on your shoulder. What exactly does this mean? I didn't know, so I had to look it up. Mary, Miriam Webster's definition of having a chip on one shoulder, informal, quote, to have an angry or unpleasant attitude or way of behaving caused by belief that one has been treated unfairly in the past. Synonym, synonyms and antonyms of chip on one's shoulders. An inclination to fight or quarrel. It was clear from the, his tone of writing that the man had a chip on his shoulder. People who have a racial chip on their shoulder have the wrong outlook and people like that will never get anywhere in life with an attitude like that. And would it surprise you to learn that the synonyms also include are very negative, aggression, belligerence, combativeness, defiance, feistiness, fight, pugnacity, quarrelsomeness, scrappiness, truculence. Why is this leveled particularly at black boys? present company included when I was at school and in my early career at the bar. Why should we be accused of this because we draw attention to and highlight obvious inequalities and unfairness that affects, that affects an entire race of people? It turns a problem back on the person. And then another charge we will be met with when we raise issues of racism. If you don't like it here, why don't you just go back insert country of choice or you should be grateful for what you have or if you criticize the country you're anti-british or why are you blaming me for what my ancestors did i didn't do it or why don't you pick yourself up by your boot strings and just get on your bike or and i like this this is norman tebbit approach what which side do you cheer for in cricket or we're all colorblind, or everyone can make it to the top. It's all about individual merit, or it's got nothing to do with race, or I'm not a racist. You see, the privileges of whiteness are often taken for granted and not understood by those upon whom it's bestowed. You see, you can make it to the top of your profession and yet still be harassed because of the color of your skin. Examples. Here are some examples of black professionals or celebrities. In December, 1989, Rupert Taylor, lay preacher, was reported to have been awarded 100,000 pounds damages by a high court jury against the Metropolitan Police for false imprisonment, malicious prosecution, and for having cannabis planted on him. The sum was subsequently reduced to 60,000. In March, 1990, Linford Christie, we all know who Limpet is, athlete, received £30,000 in damages after he was wrongly uh, arrested for the theft of a rented car. In May 1990, Garth Crooks, the, uh, the footballer, um, was reported to have been racially harassed by the Metropolitan Police in Oxford Street, stopped on suspicion of theft and handling stolen goods. He lodged a, an official complaint. 
Morris Hope in 1990, the boxer, was reported to receive £50,000 in damages from the Met Police for being racially harassed and falsely accused of having smoked cannabis and eaten several packets of the drug. Colin McMillan, the boxer, was reported to receive a £2,000 settlement from the Met for after having his car stopped and searched for drugs. And there are many more examples. You just need to look at what happened last year in the year of COVID um, with um, Dawn Butler MP being stopped and um, the Great British great britain athlete as akala says it's usually taken for granted by those it protects that the absence of whiteness can literally be the make the difference between life and death so throw white privilege into a discussion and the awkwardness the defensiveness can multiply astronomically next slide please so what is white privilege the reality that a white person's whiteness has come and continues to come with an array of benefits and advantages not shared by many people of colour. It doesn't mean that I, as a white person, don't work hard. I do. Or that I haven't suffered. Well, I've known struggle, but simply that I have received help, often unacknowledged assistance because I am white. John uh, Greenberg. And Greenberg gives 10 examples of um, white privilege. And let me run through some of these lists as I come close to the end of this talk. Having the privilege of having a positive relationship with the police generally, being favored by education authorities, attending the best schools of influence, learning about your race in school, finding children's books that overwhelmingly represent your race, soaking in media, blatantly biased towards your race, escaping violent stereotypes associated with your race, playing the colorblind card of wiping the slate clean of centuries of racism, being insulated from the daily toll of racism and living ignorant in dire states of racism today. Uh, Ella Alexander gives um, some more examples. If I can, I, I wish I can arrange to be in the company of people of my, of my race most of the time. If I want to move, I can be pretty sure of renting or purchasing housing in an area in which I can afford and in which I want to live. Being pretty sure that my neighbors in such a location will be neutral or pleasant to me. I can go shopping alone most of the time, pretty well assured that I will not be followed or harassed. I can turn on the television or open the front page of the paper and see people, people of my race widely represented. When I'm told about my, my national heritage or about civilization, I'm shown that people of my color made it what it is. I can be sure that children, my children will be given the curricular materials that testify to the existence of their race. And so on. But white privilege is not an expression that has just come about recently, Macintosh identified an array of important privileges that many white people have, including speaking in public to a powerful male group without putting their race on trial, doing well in a challenging situation without being called, oh, you're a credit to your race, or, oh, you spoke really well, Leslie, or being worried about racism without being seen as self-interested or self-seeking, or choosing blemished colored covers or bandages in flesh color and having them more or less match your white skin. One of my bugbears, turning up late for a meeting without having the lateness reflect on your race. I personally hate that expression oh, you're on black people's time. It's offensive, it's racist. All people have the ability to be bad timekeepers and it's not unique to any race. There isn't any laziness, black gene or any black lazy gene. Feeling welcomed and normal in the usual walks of public life, institutional and social. Now, let me add some of my own. Not having to worry about whether a taxi will stop for you when you're late, working late in chambers and you want to get home. Not having to have that talk 
with your sons about being careful of the police because they are black. Not having to anglicise your name on your CV because you're worried that your application might not be considered on its merit. Being mistaken often for the defendant, the defendant's brother, father, clerk, or anyone other than the barrister when you walk into court. Deciding not to buy a flash car, but buying a cheap, beat up old model because you've been stopped on too many occasions and you know that a black man driving a flash car will bring attention to yourself. When you walk down the road and you see a woman clutch their bag close to you when they see you in a way that they don't if someone white walks past them. And I could go on and on. So where do we go? And what should we do? New Zealand lawyer and um, mediator Paul Sills provides some answers. He argues that diversity is important because it is beneficial to have individuals with various talents within the group, company or social setting. Yeah, that's the variety argument. But he also gives the understanding each other argument that in other words, diversity encourages individuals to embrace some of the qualities of humanism, not necessarily as religious or philosophical policy, but as a way of relating to each other. Then there's a sensitivity argument by learning about and understanding different traditions of a friend or colleague at work, we become more sensitive to those traditions. And then there's the um, uh, enhanced creativity argument you can't solve a problem from the same level of thinking that created it. That's Einstein. Different backgrounds and cultures approach conflict in different ways. People with diverse backgrounds can often provide insights and new approaches to address difficult moral and legal and other dilemmas. And then there's the educational argument. Diversity educates us all. We all become less ignorant. And then there's the innovation argument. Pro pro productivity flourishes in culturally diverse settings. The mind expanded, expands when encountering modes of thinking that differ from our own. Diversity produces innovation, which in turn propels economic growth. And then there's the economic growth argument. Diversity through globalization has brought into the world's most cosmopolitan cities tangible benefits from personal development to enriching communities and the economy as a whole. Still concludes, People who have grown up in multicultural societies often find it not only normal, but desirable to live with people of different backgrounds. Diversity is not merely tolerated, but something to be actively sought out. Sill's arguments are, are powerful and persuasive. We all have to embrace these arguments. It's the job of this profession to acknowledge and present these arguments present persuasively and convincingly in it's the anti-racist way. But why? because this leads to less pushback and all reluctance. It overcomes the suggestion that this is just being politically correct talk. It's so much more than this. White members of our profession need to understand that when questioning things the way they currently are, this isn't about you as an individual being attacked, shamed, accused, or being judged. And these are normal reactions to be expected, but it's more about a recognition that the system is unfair and we as a profession can improve our lot. Question it's about being good or bad or irrelevant. It's a recognition that advantage may well be tied up to race and this is systemic. We should forget about the guilt and take action. History matters. Bias is implicit and often unconscious. More importantly, it takes great courage to change the system. Next slide, please. We all have to realize that one size does not fit all since racism, sexism, heterosexism are not all the same and the advantages associated with them should not be seen as the same. In addition, it's hard to disentangle aspects of unearned advantage that rests more on social class, economic class, race, religion, sex and ethnic identity than on other factors, Macintosh. Let me say something about indifference as I come to the end of this talk. Neither love nor terror makes one blind. Indifference makes one blind. That's what James Baldwin wrote. Hope. We can all achieve equity and equality among people. It's not gonna be easy, but as Baldwin wrote, those who say it cannot be done are usually interrupted by, the, by others doing it. Next slide, please. Remember, 
Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. Next slide. Here's an interesting um, slide about how to become anti-racist, and I will make sure this is put up on the um, INS um, web. And I want to finish with a poem. Next slide. It's a poem by um, Edgar Albert Guest, and it's called It Couldn't Be Done. Next slide. Someone said that it couldn't be done, but he with a chuckle replied that maybe it couldn't, but he would be one who wouldn't say so till he tried. So he buckled right in with a trace of a grin on his face. He worried he hid it. He started to sing as he tackled the thing that couldn't be done. And he did it. Somebody scoffed. Oh, you'll never do that. At least no one has ever done it. But he took off his coat and took off his hat. And the first thing we know, he'd begun it with a lift of his chin and a bit of a grin without any doubting or quit it. He started to sing as he tackled the thing that couldn't be done. And he did it. Next slide. There are thousands to tell you it cannot be done. There are thousands to prophesy failure. There are thousands to point out to you one by one the dangers that wait to assail. But just buckle in with a bit of a grin. Just take off your coat and go do it. Just start to sing as you tackle the thing that cannot be done. And you'll do it. Thank you. Thank you. I wonder if you can put me back on video. There we go. Thank you. Um, I'm going to hesitate uh, to say anything about this uh, lecture, Master Thomas being a white uh, judge. And I hope you don't think that it's patronizing in any way when I say that was really thoroughly thought provoking in, in the best way. Uh, one thing that I was thinking as we went through is that we should always have um, our history in mind and everybody's history in mind, not least because we can learn from history, but also because it isn't history. It's still going on, a lot of it. Uh, and we should always be examining how we can do better in relation to equality and fairness. And that's something we really need to grapple with uh, in the law. But one thing that you did draw attention to, I think, was the McPherson report. And I think that anyone looking from outside might have thought Sir William McPherson came from probably a very privileged background uh, and that he was probably the least likely person to have come up with the answers that he did. And I think it just shows what people can do when they look hard and they see and they have, as uh, the quote said, uh, a good uh, um, impetus to try and change things. So thank you very much for that. And I hope we're going to get some uh, questions now, which I think we've seen on the, on the Q&A. Somebody already uh, asked some questions. Uh, I think in fact, um, Bridget Galloway asked a question uh, in the chat, which hasn't uh, yet, I think, probably come uh, onto the uh, Q&A yet. But she said um, she'd heard that someone say that a black person uh, can't be racist. And is that possible? Perhaps you'd like to answer that one. Um, I, I think um, anybody can be racist. Um, I don't agree. I don't subscribe to the view that, um, um, you know, your race somehow makes you immune from being racist. Um, but, but don't take my word for it. Um, um, Professor Kendi, in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, talks about his personal journey and how he had certain views about um, African-Americans, you know, um, not pulling up their bootstraps and so on and um realize that you know if you're an anti-racist you you you, you, you if you believe in anti-racism you believe that anybody can be the subject of racist thinking racist ideology regardless of your color so um the short answer is yes black people can be racist Yes, I'm also going to ask you a question from Chloe Arnold, and I think it's a question that a lot of people ask now. Uh, can you explain why you shudder at the use of, uh, or perhaps overuse of, BAME? Because it, 
lumps us all together. It's a, it's a convenient term um, that has been used to um, describe all people of colour as if we all have the same issues. Um, we, we all confront the same problems. And it obscures. And can, can I give you an example? Um, if you if you if you look at our profession, for example, and you look at the figures, if you look at the bar standards figures in 2019, if you were just to take the expression Bain and to look at that, you'd see that I, I I'm doing this off the top of my head, but I think it was something like um, in the um, uh, judiciary there was something like um, eight or nine percent. Now I might have got the figures wrong, but I'm just using that as an example of BAME people. But when you dug down into the stats, people of African heritage as judges were something like 1.3%. Not all people of colour have the same experiences. And the problem with BAME is it tends to mask um, what is actually going on. And so I, I think... Uh, if you, you know, if somebody is, um, you know, I'm, I'm of um, African Caribbean heritage, uh, you know, I, I say I'm of African heritage, you know, um, it's obvious I'm of African heritage. Well, why would you, why would you want to call me Bain? Yes, can I ask you on behalf of uh, Sarah Clark, who says as a white female QC, what can she do to make things better? Um, there's a number of things um, that we can all do. I think the first thing is, um, is I think we should all educate ourselves and be conscious of the fact that there is a problem. And even if we don't think there's a problem, there's a lot of material to um, look at. Now, um, Sally McLean um, of the In Library has um, put together a reading list on this talk. I, I did a lot of research when doing this talk. Um, well, I think it was a lot of research. Uh, and a, a lot of the materials that I have used, I've put in the, the reading list. And, and it, it's not that onerous. Um, I can make some suggestions of places where I think people should start. Um, so. I think that Ker Kerry, in fact, is putting up uh, a reading list for uh, people on the yeah. website yeah. Uh, and follow up for this lecture. Yeah, absolutely. And so um, some books that were really, I, I just thought were just brilliant. Um, Akala's book, Natives, is it's a fantastic read, it really is. And, and it's an easy read as well. Um, Lawal's The Clapback talks about the um, racial stereotypes and where a lot of these stereotypes come from. I'd certainly recommend that. And again, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an enjoyable read. I think everybody should read Kendi, Kendi X's, um, 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 how to be an anti-racist and then one article that I was sent in fact I was sent yes I was sent it yesterday um, by um, Master Solanke thank you very much I, I think she might be watching but uh, Master Solanke sent me um, uh, the Peggy McIntosh um, you know um, privileges like a knapsack um, and Macintosh wrote that paper in 1988. It's a very short paper and I just got it off the web and I, the link is there. Fantastic read about what, what white privilege actually means. Well, it's a fantastic quote, isn't it? Uh, that you had, in fact, we had it up on the screen for quite a time. Uh, and I think we've all read that. 
Can I combine two uh, questions that uh, two people have asked? So that's Karma Young and Matthew Gillett. Uh, what they say is that steps have been trying, uh, taken to try and combat racism in the legal profession. And there's been a huge push for increasing diversity at the bar. Uh, but do you think that racism is still at a level which puts people off pursuing a legal career? And also any tips uh, which you would have for making the privileged profession more diverse? Uh, yeah, uh, um, so um, I would invite, um, so the two, two parts of the question, let me, let me break it down. So the first part is, it is racism still a problem? Yes, it is. It, you, you know, the, 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 the bar, the profession is not the same as it was when I started 30 odd years ago. It's, it's not as in your face. Right, you know, 30, 30 odd years ago, um, there was a much more insensitivity. There was much more overt racism. I mean, say, if you think about it, we, 30 odd years ago when I started, you know, we st you could still catch reruns on TV in the late <laughs> of programs like Alf Garner. You could still catch reruns of that awful program, Mind Your Language um you know we, we you know we had a lot of racist television in just ordinary uh, media and the bar was you know was not immune from that um you know there were judges and members of the judiciary who said really inappropriate things now you know i can give you a couple of examples i was told by one um, senior judicial figure Mr. Thomas, we don't do things like that in this country. And, I, I, you know, I'll, that will stay with me because I had to say, well, what country do you think I'm from? Um, so, but, th you know, so things, th there's no two ways about it. Things have changed and change um, for the better. But uh, are there still problems? Of course there are. You, you know, <laughs> look, you know that there's still problems, or certainly the perception of problems. When I go to an in event, and I be, you know, so it might be a an outreach event or student event, and I'll have lots of young black students or would be barristers come around me and ask me, look, you know, I'm having difficulties, or what's it like, or I'm really worried about entering the profession. We know, so, so that, that one example, and we know that there's still problems when you, when we just look, when we look at the sectors of the profession, which still are very much exclusively white. Look at, you know, the commercial, the tax bar, right? And we know that this, and even if, when we, even when we look to parts of the profession, which have more color to them, such as the criminal or family bar, just look at the bar standards recent report on income at the bar. How, how is it that we are a profession where black women are the lowest earners in, in, in those areas where, you know, um, it might be publicly funded work compared to their white counterparts. You know, on the face of it, th th there are questions that need to be asked. So have the, do we still have problems? Of course we still have problems. Just be, you know, we still have problems. You know, I I've given the example of um, Alexandra Wilson and Luke, Luke McLean, um, being mistaken for the defendant or anybody other than the barrister. You know, I thought all of that nonsense um, would have subsided, but you speak to most um, black barristers or indeed barristers of color. Um, you know, most of, them will, most of them will tell you a similar story in a way that you won't hear from white barristers. Well, just to pick up on one of the things that you've just said, Kellen Bacon has asked how you think people of colour and particularly people of African heritage can be encouraged to enter parts of the profession where they're currently underrepresented, for example, the Chancery and Commercial Bar. 
I think the Chancery and Commercial Bar uh, need to look at their systems of recruitment very strongly. Um, so, uh, for instance, uh, they if if you have a system whereby traditionally um, you, you you think the best equals um, people from the two top universities, and you and and you have an idea that you know somehow you will be dumbing down your um, chambers by recruiting elsewhere then the problem is not going to go away because there's as I've been saying in this talk there is a problem there's a systemic problem in terms of numbers and so I think um, looking and valuing other qualities which are just as um, um, valuable quality. So, so can I give you an example? Something that my Chambers Garden Court does. Academ academic um, um, uh, merits is obviously one factor that somebody can take into account when recruiting, but it's not the only um, criteria. So if you have, um, you know, somebody who has done extremely well um, but they didn't go to, say, an, an Oxbridge um, University or Russell Group University, but they've ended up with an extremely um, good degree. And you see, when, when you look closely, you see that this is a person who um, was a refugee. You know, they, they learn English as a second language. Um, then you learn from their story that they had been tortured. And despite all of those odds, they've come to another country, they've um, got to the top and they've, you know, and they've got through. That says something about the tenacity of an individual like that. Why would you not want to, um, you know, look at somebody or at least interview somebody like that? Whereas if you've got a system whereby you immediately eliminate um, a, a, a load of talent based on um, something as crude as um, just university and the types of university. Um, so I think there's a number of ways that we can be look re-looking at how we recruit. And that's just, that's just one example. And so um, and Emma Talbot asks an interesting question. Do you think Chambers have a responsibility to make CV blind pupillage applications the norm? The, the, there, there was, the, there's been a lot of interest in, there's been a lot of interest in um, um, work on that. I want to say yes and I want to say no. And, 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 and can, let me explain why I say yes and no. Um, it's, there's a lot of research that shows that where individuals anglicize their names, they get, re, they get offered um, interviews. Whereas, you know, you know if they have an, um, an, a name that isn't an anglicized name, um, they don't. And so that would be an argument for, um, you know, having a uh, blind, as it were, C, um, interview CV process. So I can see that. But on the other hand, the, the, the example I gave whereby, you know, somebody who, whose history, their, their story, when they tell their story um, and, and the importance of their story is a positive factor that Chambers should have a system of taking into account. I think a blind system might may well disadvantage individuals like that. So, you know, I don't, I, 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 I don't have all the um, ideas. I need to think that one through. 
Yes, and I'm going to ask a, a question. I think you 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 um, dealt with it partly in your in your lecture, but uh, do you? Th this is from Pedro Gaspar. Do you think nowadays, with more information and better laws, people intend to be less racist than they were forty or thirty years ago? I don't know. And do they achieve that? Uh, I I I don't know. You know. Um, I had a really interesting conversation with um, somebody this weekend. I, I think it was uh, uh, Friday or Saturday. Uh, uh, we were talking about this talk and me preparing for it. And I sent my talk out to some very um, good friends for them to, you know, um, have a look at it. Uh, Raggy, um, Amit, Master Solanke. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, and sorry, and David, David Neal, um, and Louise. <laughs> sorry, I've got to, I've got to get everybody in that I asked to have a look at it. Um, so what they said to me was this: It's all very well saying, you know, uh, law. You, you have all these laws and everything, and you um, reduce obvious discrimination, if I can put it in that way. But the real test is, the real test as to whether or not you've achieved what you want to achieve is not what you have in the workplace or only in the workplace. So, okay, so you might, you might be in a set of chambers and your set of chambers might, you know, you might have some black faces in your chambers. But the real test is, real acceptance in social life so you invite one person round for dinner to share a meal with your family and when you look at who you're who's in your social spectrum is it are you do you just have a social spectrum that is essentially you know you, the people of colour that you mix with are at work, or are the people who you mix with of colour also beyond work? And I found that really interesting because, you know, um, I do a lot of events at the for the inn, and uh, I know a lot of people at the inn. And you know, you know, some of the people I would say I'm quite close to in terms of, um, you know events you know doing the advocacy I've done the advocacy for many years and then I think to myself um do, we, do I really know these people other than beyond what I'm doing professionally and so I think and I, and I was trying to make this point um earlier on in the talk it's not just about doing things in a legal way it's about changing mindsets and it's about changing your own internal mindset and changing your own internal mindset means, you know, where, 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 where somebody, even if somebody doesn't look like you, you know, do, do, are they part of your own private space? Yeah. I'm going to ask one final question um, uh, because I've, I've looked uh, through the question. I know we have quite a lot of open question. I've tried to pick those which are typical of uh, most of the questions, but there's an interesting question from Emma Cross, who says that she's a barrister in which uh, in chambers where there are no people of color apart from one of the clerks and they've undertaken equality and diversity training. And she'd suggest that they also undertake anti-racist training but it was met with some slightly scandalised responses, as if she was suggesting all members of chambers were racist and the EDI training was enough. And do you have any tips, especially for junior people, on trying to push through more of an anti-racist agenda in chambers? Yeah, I, 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 I think this is where we, and when I say we, uh, Master Reed, I'm talking about you, me, those of us who are in the senior parts of the profession have to see if we can influence chambers to, you know, it, the burden shouldn't fall on the shoulders of the junior members or, you know, and, you know, junior members do tend to be more enlightened, don't they? 
you know, the older we get, the more set in our ways. Um, and, you know, it's a difficult battle. This is not an easy subject because as I've tried to get across in this talk, when you, and, and, and may I say this, this is not just a problem with the traditional sets of chambers. Also, some of the more progressive sets of chambers um, have a real problem. It, 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 despite the fact that in some of the mo more progressive sets of chambers, you may think, well, you know, you, you, that they appear more diverse than some of the traditional sets. <laughs> and it's not a high bar to jump, is it, <laughs> if, if you compare it? But, but uh, uh, let me explain the, the problems that um, are faced by the traditional sets and the progressive sets. In the traditional sets, um, it's the, I'm not, you know, the suggestion is we are racist, therefore the suggestion is there's a problem with us as an individual. And it's the whole, it's the whole thing I was saying in the talk. It, it, people taking it personally as opposed to thinking about privilege systems you know you know moving beyond um the uh somebody in, uh, in, in adopting an anti-racist approach is looking at systems or individuals from the progressive po point of view th there's this idea that we on the left um who've been fighting the good cause uh, you know, uh, our, our socialist values, how dare you suggest that we possibly could be racist? And so y y it's the same problem, um, you, but from different angles. Uh, look, you know what? Everybody just needs to get over it. We can all be racist. We can all do better. And that that's the point. We can all do better. But I, I, I think, so I didn't catch the name of the person who asked the question, but whoever it was, I think the difficulty that you face in chambers is going to be one of power. And, uh, and where you have that problem with power, because y y eventually this is what's going to happen. It's going to be the power of the purse that's going to make a difference. Not solicitors, but clients. And we've seen this happen in America, whereby large corporations are say, are, uh, um, have got anti-discrimination, anti-racist policies. And, and, and so when you have legal teams, you have these American law firms are saying, hang on a second, where are the black faces? And if you don't have black faces, we ain't gonna instruct you. So the power of the purse is eventually going to lead the way. And that's what's gonna happen with, um, um, predominantly white chambers in, in this country as uh, as we look to trade particularly after brexit where we're trying to do more trade with um countries like like the states you know you, you, i think the power of the purse is going to make a difference yes well thank you very much i'm i'm sorry i think we're going to have to wind this up now but i know there are a number of unasked unanswered questions but as i say i've tried to pick some out which represent uh, the majority so thank you all for attending. Once again, I'd just like to thank uh, Master Leslie Thomas for his uh, lecture, which so many of you on the uh, sidebar have said that you found really interesting and thanking him for the work that he's doing. So thank you to you all. We'll all finish that now. Thank you. Thank you.